Good to see you all today. I'm glad to be with you. As we get started, uh, shall we pray together? Father God, we thank you that you've given us the precious gift of your Bible, your Word. And we ask that you will bring it to life for us today, and that you will apply it to our hearts as you continue to lead us day by day on our pathway to forever with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, I don't think I've mentioned a piece of my story about how I came to the Lord. You see, it, uh, it so happened that uh, I was living in Asheville, North Carolina, and not particularly interested in, in anything uh, about God. I was about 16, I think. And so there were lots of other things that were occupying my attention, uh, lots of other things I was interested in. And my grandmother was going to uh, a church, you know, across town, and, and she had just started to go there. And she said, you know, Scott, I would just be so glad if you would come with me to church. And, you know, the thing is, grandmas have an un fair power because <laughs> because you don't want to say no to your grandmother right uh, it just it just feels like it's such a wrong thing you know come help me with this okay you know I want you to come to church with me all right so so that's kind of how well she said there's this young man here that's doing a, a series of meetings and I just would really like for you to come now I went and, and admittedly uh, I was kind of late now, uh, so late that I didn't really hear much of the meeting, uh, unfortunately. But I went again after the meetings uh, were done. But the thing is, is even though I didn't really hear much of what was said in that meeting, it made a difference in my grandmother's life. And then in turn, she kept working with me. And after a while, I went to another church in another part of town, and that pastor started working with me, and then eventually I was baptized, and I came to the Lord. But see, this poor guy who was doing these meetings, I don't think anyone necessarily had a big change of heart. I think a lot of the people there were, they, they were agreeing with what he was saying. They were just being enriched, but maybe they didn't need to be baptized. They didn't... Uh, weren't coming to the Lord for the first time, but you see, he didn't know that in ministering to those folks, to my grandmother, that he made a difference in my life through her, and that my life continued on that track. So he never knew. All he was doing was doing what he had come there to do on the Lord's behalf. God had called him to go to this place to do this ministry at this particular time. And he never knew of a lot of the impact that he made. See, the interesting thing about this guy is he was from Southern Adventist University, and he was doing his field school evangelism for his theology training as to be a pastor. And I ended up later going to Southern Adventist University and doing the same thing. But he never knew. And I've never met anyone that knew him. His name was Chris Newell, and no one ever, no one ever knows him. And it's kind of funny, because you would think, in, in the time that I've talked to people, someone would know him. But he, God used him to set some things in motion in my life through my grandmother. And this has always made a profound impact on me, because what it tells me is, even in our lives, when we think that we are doing just normal things, or even when we are doing things that we feel God has asked us to do, if we don't see the impact immediately, there may be a very large impact that we might never see with our own eyes. We may never know until we get to be with the Lord in heaven, but God is using it. And today I want to spend some time with some ordinary folks in the Bible, some ordinary folks that God used to do some extraordinary things. You see, this is Exodus chapter 1, if you want to turn there with me. Exodus chapter 1. We usually zoom right past this, don't we? We usually just hurry up and run through it and get to Moses. But we're going to just 
put on the brakes a little bit here today, if, you, if you'll in, indulge me here, and, and we're going to see what God does in Exodus chapter 1. You see, verses 1 through 7 say, Now these are the names of the children of Israel who came to Egypt. Each man and his household came with Jacob, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All of those who were descendants of Jacob were 70 persons, people, for Joseph was in Egypt already. And Joseph died, and all his brothers, and all that generation. But the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied, and grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with. You see, we're picking up right where Genesis left off. And if we were reading straight through and we finished Genesis, we would have just finished the, the story arc of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and heard all the promises that God gave. And we would be itching, especially if this was the first time we had read that story, we would be itching in the next book to say, Now, God, you better make good on those promises. I'm eager to see them happen. And you see, he had promised to make them a great nation and of course give them a, a land uh, and, and, and territory and, and we would be wanting to see this happen and God does not disappoint actually. You see, think about it. A family of 70 people goes down to Egypt and then in just a short time, relatively, they become more prosperous and multiply to be more than the people who are already there in that nation. We can't, we can't miss the significance of this, the significance of God's amazing work in their lives. But you see, unfortunately, the satisfaction of God fulfilling His promise is not the only thing that we find. You see, it's a little short-lived because the horror of the next verses hit us. In verses 8 through 14, see they say, Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph, well, he knew of him, he just didn't like him, <laughs> didn't want to pay attention to his history. And he said to the people, look, the people, of, uh, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly. Has anybody dealt shrewdly with you? And let, let's, let us deal shrewdly with them. <laughs> lest they multiply and it happen in the event of war that they also join our enemies and fight against us and go up out of the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh supply cities, Python and Ramses, but the more they afflicted them and the more they multiplied, and they were in dread of the children of Israel. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor, they made their lives bitter with hard bondage and mortar and brick and all manner of service in the field. All their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. The very promise God fulfills causes the Egyptians to fear the Israelites. See, they hadn't been hostile. They hadn't given, given any reason to be hated except for their prosperity. See, the, the enslavement and abuse that was inflicted upon them and the later crimes done to their children was an evidence that the Egyptians had come to fear and despise Israel so much that they were dehumanized in their eyes. No longer were they normal people. No, they were monsters to be feared and animals to be tamed. You see, this is a lesson for us today, friends. It's when we as individuals, but even more so as a community, allow fear to be the primary driver of our actions. We will most likely end up dreadfully wronging other people before we know it. The more we emphasize what separates us to the, from others, the more we'll forget that all humans are made in the image of God. And people created in His, in His image that deserve dignity, respect, See, when the oppression didn't work, friends, Pharaoh turned to an even crueler method. Look at verse 15 with me. It says, The king of Egypt spoke 
to the Hebrew midwives. Meet our protagonists today, friends. He spoke to the Hebrew midwives who were named Shifra and Hua. And he said, when you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stools, if it's a son, then you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. Boy, I tell you, he told the Hebrew midwives to kill all the male children. The, the horror of this is unthinkable. Uh, it's an absolutely monstrous crime. Can you imagine how terrible that would be for a mother to have just given birth and when the, it's like the most loving, tender, strongest, bonded moment and to have her baby taken away from her and killed. Monstrous. Absolutely terrible. And it came from Pharaoh. I don't want you to miss the power imbalance here. The abuse of power. The most powerful man in that region of the world had just given these two enslaved women who had a very dirty job a direct order. There would have been no question at that time who was more uh, important and powerful in that conversation. And there was probably no question in the minds of the midwives what would happen to them if they said, oh, excuse me, sir, I don't think I'm going to do that. <laughs> No, it's, it's, that wasn't really an option, was it? See, the interesting fact, though, about this story is that the midwives are the only characters in this part of the story with names. Did you catch that? You see, after we get through all of the backstory of Exodus at the beginning, which, which that's just God catching us up. He's saying, okay, now remember, just in case it's been a while since you read Genesis, I want you to get up to speed here on what's going on. But when you get into the present day story, the only people named are the midwives. Yeah, isn't that interesting? You see, the next person that's actually named is Moses later on. The hint of the name giving is actually the God telling us that these are the people that he considers to be most important in this part of the story. The people that he sees as having a future. See, God turns the norm on his head. History recorded without God's inspiration wouldn't have cared at all about the midwives. Most ladies throughout all history were not even mentioned. Because the guys, I guess, were writing all the history. <laughs> I don't know. But, but they focused on all the rulers and what they did, the kings, the, the mighty people, the people with all the power. They would have named Pharaoh for sure. Pharaoh is just a title. It's not a name. But you see, God's history comes from a different angle. The people honored by him are the faithful people, no matter how unimportant they are to the world's eyes. These ladies could have submitted out of fear because he was a very powerful man. But they feared and followed God instead. Let's see what they did. Verse 17. But the midwives fear who? <coughs> fear Pharaoh? Are you sure? No, did I? Is, no, no, no. I think, no. Does it say Pharaoh? No, it doesn't say Pharaoh. It says they feared who? God. They feared God. Yes, they did. They feared God. And they did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them. That seems like a death sentence. They didn't do what he commanded them, but saved the male children alive. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing and saved the male children alive? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, Well, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are lively and give birth before the midwives can come. Now, okay, yes... This was probably a fib, okay? This might have been a fib. Maybe it was exactly the truth. I don't know. But, but they may have fibbed a little bit just to cover their backs, okay? Um, <laughs> but what they did took commitment, courage, and faithfulness. Two obscure people were suddenly thrust into a life or death situation, and they decided to risk their lives 
to save other people's children. They knew that they almost certainly would have died. But the irony of this is that Pharaoh was thwarted by women. Thwarted by women while he was so afraid of the men. He was so afraid of the men, of the children of Israel, that he said, we've got to get rid of all these boy babies because they're going to be the ones that are going to thwart me. I don't need the women. Who, what are they going to do, right? Well, actually, Pharaoh, <laughs> he was thwarted by the women. See, there's actually no talk in this part of the story. Now, we'll get to the men later on with Moses and Aaron, etc., but in this part of the story, there's actually not a record of the men doing anything against Pharaoh. Not yet. But women, two <laughs> obscure women, doing just something that's simply heroic. Saving the day. Amen. They were nobodies. Absolutely nobody. And they became heroes because they were faithful to God. Amen. Pharaoh was later thwarted again by two women. Moses' mommy. Jacobed, and his own daughter thwarted his purpose. And, of course, later on, Moses, because of that thwarting, was able to grow up the deliverer, the human deliverer of God's people, was able to grow up right under Pharaoh's nose. Well, Exodus 1, chapter 20 through 21, gives a little, uh, a little uh, result to this. You see, and we might expect to see the account saying, so Pharaoh had the midwives hanged, and then he found some other midwives that would do what he wanted to do, right? <laughs> but it says, therefore, God, it doesn't talk about Pharaoh, I guess Pharaoh just kind of sulked, I don't know what he did. Therefore, God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very mightily. And so it was, because the midwives feared God, that he provided households for them. Who can say? what far-reaching influence they had on Israel's destiny. We don't know if maybe the midwives, Shifra and Pua, maybe they saved Joshua and Caleb's parents. Maybe they were born and later had Joshua and Caleb because of what they had done. We don't know. But we know that many little baby boys didn't die because of them. Who knows? what they set in motion. Pharaoh, though, he said, well, if these midwives aren't going to help me out, I'm going to go to more drastic measures. He called upon all Egyptians to help eradicate all the male children by throwing them into the Nile River. 22 says, every son who is born, he said to all his people, every son who is born, you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save the life. He's still not getting it. You know, he's, he's thinking too much about the guys here, and he's forgetting that the ladies can thwart him just as much. But the irony of this is Pharaoh wanted to kill all the male children, and God later only threatened to kill the firstborn after Pharaoh was so persistent in going against him. You see, even in God's necessary judgment, he is never so cruel as, as, as sinful man is. Amen. The sinful man is absolutely cruel. And God is always much, much, much more merciful. Amen. But see, this Nile River development uh, seems to be a worse situation before, but actually God uses it to bring Moses into contact with Pharaoh's daughter. And like I mentioned before, it causes him to be brought up in Pharaoh's own household. He paid for his education, his food, his lodging, just because of some faithful tender-hearted ladies who just did the right thing. No one can underestimate the power of any individual who just has a, a kind, God-filled, merciful heart who just does the right thing in any given situation. We may not see it. We may not be on television, and we may not be on the cover of a magazine, and, and everyone around the world may not know our name, but God knows our name. He says, see, that's my child. They did that for me. They did the right thing. God wants you to be faithful today, friends. He wants you to work for Him, but you might be saying, well, but how do I work for Him today? The situation was different back then. There aren't a, 
you know, the, there, no one's asking me to kill a bunch of babies, thank God. Um, how does God want an ordinary person to be faithful to Him now? How can I make an impact? Well, I want you to buckle your seatbelts. These pews have seatbelts, don't they? Do they have, Pastor, do they have seatbelts? They should have seatbelts. No. I want, to, I want you to buckle your seatbelts. This is a story that blew my mind. At a Baptist church in Crystal Palace near South London, the Sunday service was ending. And a man asked the pastor to tell a testimony. He said, please, please, pastor, I just, I got to say something. He was a new guy, and he said, oh, the pastor looks at his watch, and he says, you've got three minutes. Okay, it was already late. And the man said he had been visiting family in Sydney, Australia, about three months back. And he was walking down St. George Street, and a strange little white-haired man stepped out of a shop. He handed him a pamphlet and asked, a very simple question. He asked if I would be ready for heaven if I happened to die tonight. Well, it shocked me because no one had ever asked me this question before, and I thanked him courteously, and I left. It bothered me all the way back to Heathrow Airport. When I got back, I called a friend who was a Christian, and thank God he led me to Christ. The whole church applauded because, of course, we love, church. We love stories like that, don't we? Well, see, that that's not the end of the story. You see, the next week, that Baptist pastor flew to Adelaide, Australia, to do a series of meetings. And about ten days later, in the middle of the series, a woman came to him for counseling, and he wanted to assess where she was with Christ. And she told him that she had been visiting family in Sydney a couple months back. And she was doing some last-minute shopping on St. George Street when a strange little white-haired man came up and gave her a pamphlet and asked, if she would be ready for heaven if she happened to die tonight. And she said, this disturbed me. So after I got back to Adelaide, I decided to visit this church, and the pastor led me to Christ. Now, the pastor was puzzled because he basically heard the same testimony within two weeks. He said, well, what? That's, that's odd. Well, but he was scheduled now to fly to Perth, which was on the west coast of Australia, to do a series and when he was over there, the elder, the head elder, took him out for a meal. And of course, you know, as, as Christians do, we, when we meet somebody else, we often will say, uh, now how did you come to Christ? Well, he asked him how he did. He said, well, I grew up in this church, but I actually never made a commitment to God. But I grew into a place of influence because of my leadership business ability. Now, three years ago, I was on a trip to Sydney. And a little man, who, was, who I thought was quite obnoxious at the time, handed me a pamphlet and he asked if I'd be ready for heaven if I happened to die. And I, and I tried to tell him that I'm an elder in my church. But he wouldn't listen. He just kept asking the same question. I was seething with anger all the way home to Perth. And I told my pastor, hoping that I would get some sympathy. And actually, the pastor agreed and said, you know, I have been concerned about you for a long time because it seemed like you really were not in a heart relationship with Jesus. And the pastor worked with me, and I came to Christ for real about three years ago. Now, this London preacher was even more surprised by another familiar story. Well, see, he flew home and was speaking at a convention. And he threw out these three testimonies during his sermon because they were great. I mean, he loved them. And at the end, four pastors came up to him and they said that they had come to Christ about 25 to 30 years before, and they said he wasn't white-haired then, but there was a little man that we had met in Sydney, and he gave us a pamphlet. We think it's got to be the same guy. We compared notes, and it's all the same. And the following week, he went to a similar convention in the Caribbean for missionaries, and he threw out these testimonies. And at the end, three missionaries came up and said they had come to Christ between somewhere 15 to 25 years between the three of them before from the little man on George Street in Sydney, giving them a pamphlet and asking them this question. Coming back to London, head spinning, he stopped on, the, on, on his way through uh, in, in the U.S. and he was in Atlanta. He was giving a convention for Navy chaplains and the lead chaplain took him out 